Over the course of our expedition, you've seen how we've collected different types of data to answer our initial research questions. These data sets include a GPR data set providing us with information about crevassing within the ice column, and a GPS data set telling us about surface movement over time. Now that we've collected our data, our session in the field has come to an end. After returning to Maine, we'll need to analyze and make sense of these data, using them to develop models that tell a story about the past and future of the rice ice shelf. This will help us answer our research questions. Scientific models are useful tools to represent a complex system and focus on particular areas of interest. We will utilize our data sets as evidence to develop our models to create a simulation to make predictions. While there are several type of models that scientists use, I will be using analog models or physical models, graphical models, and mathematical or numerical models. These models are useful tools to aid in our understanding of what's happening in the real world. It will also be important to understand the limitations of each model, as they are not exact representations. Before we even look at the data, we can create a physical model to help visualize some of the processes we hope to study. Using common household materials, we will make something called flubber, a slow-moving substance to represent flowing ice. Details for the recipe for this flubber can be seen below. For model setup, we'll also need a PVC pipe cut lengthwise, a shallow dish, a marker, and some sort of stopwatch. To set up the model, we will first place a ball of flubber into the corner of our shallow dish. Once this expands outward, it will model our ice shelf. Next, we will place the halved PVC pipe into the dish and raise it at an angle to create an incline. This will represent a glacial valley that feeds into an ice shelf. We will now add marks to the side of the PVC pipe that are three centimeters apart. The rest of our flubber will be placed into this valley to form a model glacier. Once the glacier flows into the ice shelf and both sets of flubber combine, we can start the experiment. We will draw a small dot on the center of the glacier just above one of our first markings. This dot represents a point like the ones we tracked using GPS. Using our stopwatch, we will now time how long it takes to pass through our gates or travel the three centimeter distance marked on our PVC pipe. We'll want to note this time in a data table. We can now cut off the flubber at the front and repeat our experiment to model how a glacier will flow without the presence of an ice shelf. What do you expect to happen to the speed of our point without the ice shelf? By comparing our times, we see that the glacier moves faster when we remove the ice shelf. This is exactly what happened with Larsen B following its breakup. For our GPR work, we acquired a number of transects of data or a single line record of each crossing our robot made across the shear zone. In this data, we can see signatures of crevasses, but it's important to understand that we're not actually seeing the images of the crevasses themselves. The data set simply gives us the time difference that it takes for the wave to travel from the transmitter to the receiver. In our data set, these crevasse signatures often show up as parabolas or curves. Let's go back to our GPR setup to understand why. Our GPR unit consists of a transmitter and a receiver. The transmitter sends waves into the ice shelf, but these waves are sent out in all directions like a cone. When our GPR unit is traveling at a constant speed and sending out cones of waves, it will detect the crevasse before it reaches it. As our unit gets closer and is on top of the crevasse, the wave has to travel a shorter distance, and this gives us the top of our parabola. Then, as the unit passes over the crevasse and continues onward, it will continue to detect the crevasse. We can use these parabolas as a graphical model. By processing this data and understanding why these parabolas form, we can use them to visualize the shape, depth, width, and orientation of our crevasses. There are some limitations with this model, however. In some cases, our area is too crevassed to actually pinpoint a specific crevasse because there's so many parabolas in our data set. We're currently looking into ways to deal with these limitations by processing our data set at different depths. A lot of my work also includes numerical modeling. In the simplest sense, it is a lot like our analog model where I want to simulate removing ice from the Ross ice shelf to see what happens to the glaciers that feed into it. I realize that looking at a set of numbers can be really boring, but to know how to use that data set to tell a story of a place that I've been to and collected data 
can actually be very rewarding. To have some ownership and know how the numbers were gathered and what they might tell us is empowering. For my model, I aim to incorporate the data sets we've collected and run it into the future to make predictions about future sea level rise. This model is fairly complex and incorporates many physical laws that will be acting on the ice shelf. The model creates a solution by applying this set of physical laws and equations after I provide an input based on our observations and data sets. I then run the model and see how it changes with time to make future predictions. The model I'm using has many strengths. It allows me to change different inputs separately and allows me to toy around with different parameters and see their effect. In particular, I want to see what happens to the ice shelf if we weaken the shear zone. Will the velocity upstream quicken? What would happen if I thin the ice shelf or remove a large chunk from the ice shelf front? All of these scenarios would be impossible to study in the real world, but can be looked at within our numerical model. Developing, testing, and understanding these models takes time. My entire thesis is devoted to this work and could take up to another three years. Once I organize all of my findings, an important milestone in the scientific process is to share data to contribute scientific knowledge to the research community. This includes publishing the data and going to various conferences to give talks and present posters. When I finally write my thesis, I will give recommendations for future research so that other scientists will be able to pick up where I left off. Science is a collective process and takes teamwork. Even if the project or goal is daunting, there will always be a support group to help you. I hope you've enjoyed following me on this trip and I've learned what it's like to be a scientist. Though my research takes me to the other end of the globe, it's our approach to asking questions to understanding the world around us that makes us all scientists. Thanks for following and talk to you soon.